Hello and welcome to today's Deep Sense Discovery Session. We are really excited to have you here. We're going to be talking about computer vision and what it takes to build a data set from, uh, from images and to use it for AI purposes in the future. Um, we're, one of the people or the person that's giving the presentation today, Amith, um, has worked with Deep Sense for quite some time building a really interesting data set. So I'm excited to learn about this and I'm sure you are as well. I think the big thing for us to give you is a bit of an interesting background about Amit because he's pursuing a master's degree in resource and environmental management at Dalhousie. He previously had uh, completed a BSc in environmental science. And that's really interesting because when we talk about building a data set for AI, many times we end up having computer science students. So we love hearing cross collaboration and interest in where AI is explored and used in other disciplines. Um, so Amit started to learn about programming as a hobby, and then he started to make some computer games and then moved towards data science and computer vision. His last job in Bangladesh was working at a software startup with uh, building out an OCR, which is um, a screen reader, a reader, a reader um, software. After his graduation, he's hoping to work as a computer vision engineer. So thank you so much for joining us today, and we are really excited that you're here. Um, to those of you who uh, are joining, we have a couple things we'd like you to think about. One is questions. Ask away. We have a Q&A section um, available on Zoom, so just type in your questions in there and we'll be sure we get to them. The second piece is introduce yourself. We have a chat function. Let us know where you are from, what you're studying, um, questions you have. Put the real questions about the content in the Q&A, but we're excited to have you here and to have you learn more. So with that, I'm going to hand the reins over, please. And Amit, uh, please take it away. Yeah, thank you, Jen, for that um, nice introduction. So um, I'm just going to be sharing my screen, and I guess we'll get started with the uh, presentation. So uh, you should be able to see uh, my title slide right now. Nope, not yet. Nope, nothing. No luck. <laughs> Zoom wasn't my friend this week either, so I feel like it's up to get us. Uh, oh, now we see it. Now we're good. Genius. And without the notes, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session on building a usable data set of images for AI. Particularly, I'll be sharing my experiences uh, from my internship building a data set of C4 images. Now, during my internship, um, as part of the DeepSense Data Readiness Program, I got the opportunity to work on an interdisciplinary ocean mapping project called the BECOME Project, which stands for Benthic Ecosystem Mapping and Engagement. Uh, Benthic, if you're not familiar with that term, just means the C4, stuff about the C4. Now, as we might be aware, uh, climate change is causing habitat disruptions all around the world, and especially in the oceans. So one of the goals of this project um, is to answer the question of what role C4 habitats play in controlling shifting patterns of species and biodiversity. The project is divided into several interconnected cross-disciplinary work, pro uh, work packages that focus on particular aspects of this question, such as uh, societal engagement, hardware technologies, fine scale and broad scale mapping. I work as part of Work Package 5, which focuses on data analytics. One of the major goals of the project is also to classify benthic habitats using deep learning and computer vision methods to be able to answer the previous question. Now, the oceans have always played a crucial role in reshaping the global biosphere and making the Earth more habitable as a planet. It produces more than half the Earth's oxygen supply and stores more than 50 times the carbon that uh, the atmosphere stores. It covers 70% of the planet and regulates the climate by transporting heat from the equators to the poles. The oceans are also important for recreation, trade, transportation, food, and medicine. They are the most, uh, the Earth's most complex ecosystem, home to an estimated 700,000 to 1 million different species. And of those, um, numerous species, two thirds of them are still unknown to us. Now, despite uh, being so important to the entire global human civilization, we know relatively little about what goes on underneath those deep blue waves. Managing the oceans requires accurate and reliable data on the ocean environment, just as uh, we require for any other, managing any other environment. 
But unfortunately, compared to the knowledge we have on terrestrial systems, we know uh, relatively little about the details of the ocean floor or benthic habitats. And here you can see uh, two quotes from two ocean experts. Both of them have emphasized the fact that we have a better understanding of the surface of the moon and Mars, other celestial bodies, than we have of the ocean floor of our own planet. And that has to do with light penetration. Uh, as we might know, light doesn't penetrate very deeply into the ocean, but we can see the surface of the moon and Mars with optical telescope. So the methods that we apply for mapping terrestrial surfaces and extraterrestrial surfaces don't really apply to the oceans. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, um, do we really know so little about the seafloor? But I've seen detailed maps of the ocean floor on Google Earth or some other place. And, and here is just that, a map of the North Atlantic ocean floor. But this is basically just a digital elevation model, which tells us how high the ocean floor is at each point, at each pixel of this image. But the problem with these maps is the resolution is quite sparse. Most of the ocean floor elevation maps has a, have a pixel resolution of one kilometer or larger. Most uh, high resolution uh, bathymetry data or digital elevation maps aren't really available for most of the global ocean floor. So uh, we might still be thinking, wh what, why do we actually need high resolution bathymetry or image data for the oceans? And to illustrate this point, uh, here's an image, a satellite image of Halifax. It's a re relatively high resolution image of around um, one meter pixel resolution. And from this image, we can uh, identify various visible features, such as uh, various landmarks, roads, water bodies, etc. And we can digitize this image and we can generate a land cover map. But now suppose if we wanted to generate um, the same land cover map, not with this one meter pixel resolution image, but with this coarse uh, five meter pixel resolution image. It, obviously, it would make our jobs a lot harder. And for most of the ocean, as I previously mentioned, we have one kilometer higher. So suppose instead of this, we had this one kilometer uh, pixel resolution image. Yeah. We can quickly see the importance of relative resolution in mapping. But um, we, we can still ask the question of why not just map the entire ocean with sonar? That's so much easier and um, more cost effective. But um, bathymetry data or seafloor elevation data only tells us so much. We can only learn about the geological and topographical layout of the landscape, but it doesn't tell us about the contents of the seafloor, what life forms, what objects are there on the seafloor. So um, and for a lot of uh, research, seafloor images and images of the terrestrial surface are, are actually used for ground truthing to actually confirm whether their predictions are true or not. And mapping the sea floor with high resolution imagery also has other benefits, such as for ocean research, fisheries, and other ocean sector businesses, helping lay, lay down submarine cables, uh, the exploitation of mineral resources, and I, I would assume the military would also be quite interested. So um, for our ocean mapping project, we collected a lot of images from different sources, and one of the larger sources was Pangea which is an open access library aimed at archiving, publishing, distributing georeference data from Earth system research. More specifically, what that means is that um, you can search for different types of data on Pangea and you can collect data sets from there. And most of it is publicly available. Uh, you can check the data set license uh, that is uh, attached with each data set. Most of it is uh, under the Creative Commons. And Pangea also provides a convenient Python API which uh, we used in the Pangea Downloader program, which searches, uh, filters, and retrieves relevant data sets from Pangea. Now, um, web scraping that we mentioned, uh, web scraping and API calls were used in the Pangea Downloader program, and web scraping is the process of extracting data from websites. Now, when we embark on a project like this that scrapes data off the web, we must be aware of the legal aspects of web scraping. It's both used by government agencies and has been the subject of uh, much publicized legal battles as well. So under the Millenn uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, any content published online is automatically copyright protected. So suppose your photos on Facebook or Instagram, 
they're they're already copyright protected, whether you um, whether you show a copyright symbol or not. So um, we want to uh, avoid any legal hassles or conundrums when we're embarking on this kind of project. So the first step to determining if web scraping is allowed for the particular context or task that we might uh, want to do is to check the terms and conditions page of the website or other relevant documentation that they might have. Uh, Pantia, for example, has a website uh, wiki. Other websites also uh, have that. They might also have a robots.txt file. For example, Facebook has, uh, you can find, find Facebook's robots.txt file in this URL. Most uh, websites have this kind of format where you can just locate it by uh, the homepage slash robot.txt. So uh, even if we've um, invested our time to uh, figure out if it's uh, legal or not, and if we're still unclear, we can just, it's best to just message the website admin administrators and ask for permission. So uh, the first step in the Pangea Downloader program is to search. Uh, so as we've mentioned previously, we search uh, Pangea with a list of search queries. A list, a list of unique uh, different search queries, uh, which are basically different variations of seafloor photographs, seabed photos, stuff like that. And uh, for each search query, we get a list of search results similar to, to this, and we merge them all together, and that generates a set of unique search results. So for uh, each search result, it is a JSON-like structure, or more generally a hash map with five keys. Uh, which has information about the data set that we can use to determine if it's relevant or not. So the URI is basically the DOI. Uh, it's, it's like a link for, our, um, for articles online. The score is the relevant score. Here's some additional HTML information that contains the data set title, the data set uh, size as well, and other information. And we also have the data set type in this uh, search result. And this is just the index in the search. Now, Pangea has uh, several types of data sets. Uh, two main types are parent and child. So as you can see, this is an example of a parent data set. And we process each of those data sets by uh, type. So as we've seen, parent data sets contain multiple children. In this case, it has 31 data sets contained within this data set. And those children can have uh, a few different types. So uh, for parent data sets, when, we, uh, when our search encounters a parent data set, we simply retrieve the list of child data sets and check each of the child data sets, if what type it is, and if it has the relevant data that we're looking for or not. So child data sets uh, are most commonly found in the tabular format, which is the familiar spreadsheet-like format with rows and columns. Here, the uh, image paths or URLs are stored in one column and uh, we find other metadata in other columns, such as where the image was taken, the depth at which it was taken, et cetera. Besides this, uh, image data sets can also be paginated where um, you can, uh, where a set of uh, nine to 20 images may be on each page and we have to iterate through these pages and uh, download them one by one. So for, tabular data sets, we could just simply um, uh, simply call, uh, make an API call and fetch a tabular data sets, but paginated data sets could not be accessed via the Pangea API. So they had to be scraped. So for scraping, what we did is basically make a get request to this page, the first page where we have images, and there we get the pagination information. We inspect this and then we uh, extract the links for page two, three, and so on and then get, make get requests to those pages and iteratively collect all the links from those pages. And you might notice uh, something here that not all of these images, the first two at least, are not of C, uh, not C4 images. This is basically a map of the path this, uh, this automated vehicle took through the ocean to take these images. And this is just some more information about the track. And um, part of the data cleaning process and uh, data cleaning and integration process at the end included uh, removing such irrelevant images and irrelevant data sets from our uh, 
from the ones that we've downloaded. So besides the tabular and paginated data sets, we also have video data sets of the C4. Uh, but for now, we've ignored those um, for several reasons. One is that um, the Pangea API raises an error whenever we try to fetch the data for a video data set. And secondly, uh, we could have tried like streaming more uh, streaming the video using some uh, scraping techniques, but um, we have to assess the marginal returns of the time and energy that we are investing into um, into processing these video data sets. And uh, what our assessment was is that um, uh, processing video data sets doesn't really benefit us that much than searching for uh, more data sets that are just of images. Finally, uh, after we've downloaded all these images, uh, all these uh, CSV files of data sets, uh, of image data sets, we uh, clean them and merge them together to create one large data set that we can use for training. And one of the common uh, hurdles and challenges uh, that we face uh, in this task is that we have um, several columns that have, uh, some columns that have uh, different names and different data sets. For example, uh, the image URL column can have uh, the name image file, image ref, URL raw. And sometimes a data set might have multiple URL columns and you have to identify uh, which one is the correct one. Uh, for example, one data set comes to mind where we had a URL column for images, then another uh, URL column for reference text. And then I think the third one was for PDFs and stuff. So after uh, cleaning and yeah, oh, another point, important point is um, the data set title uh, sometimes contains uh, relevant information that we can use to filter out certain uh, data sets, such as in our case, we, uh, the titles containing meteorological observations and sea ice conditions were considered irrelevant. We also removed any unnecessary columns or columns with duplicate information. And after that, um, what results is the Pangea the data set. And this, uh, we've divided um, the data sets that we've collected, that uh, final merge data sets into a few groups. This is the largest um, data set. The unlabeled data set contains over 2,660,000 rows of data. And it can be used for different unsupervised tasks like uh, grouping images together with similar features. Um, besides this, we also generated um, a labeled data set. Uh, as you can see on the uh, right, there are a number of columns with the suffix COV, which stands for coverage. So the values in each of these columns represents what percentage of the image is covered by that particular species or object. Um, there were to a total of 71 coverage data sets on Pangea with a total of 127,000 images. So uh, here are just a few samples from the data, uh, from the images that we've collected. Some nice images of fish, seafloor, escape, some marine plants. So and um, finally, this map shows the spatial distribution of uh, all the images that we've collected from different sources, not just Pangea. And um, what we can see is that um, Pangea covers a lot of um, areas which were not represented in other data sets as well. So um, this brings us to the end of my presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it helped to give you an idea of the workflow and challenges that we face when trying to compile um, our own data set. Thank you for listening and I'd be happy to answer any questions to you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to uh, wait to see some questions come in, but I'm going to ask one. Um, I think, you know, Adib, since we talk to a lot of different organizations, to students, to people who are trying to build out what their prediction is going to be, and I'll often hear, well, we're going to get an AI to do that without really thinking through the, the pieces around um, what kind of images they need, how many images they need, um, how they need to label the image and how it needs to be categorized. So can you talk a little about how you first decided how to target which images? And did you have some thorough discussions around what you needed to find? And what are some steps that people can think about going through as they're trying to narrow down the scope of the 
images you're gonna build out for the training sets. Hey, um, yeah, so pretty good question, Jen. And I think it's a very important question that we all must think about because our models are only uh, as good as our data. So this is more of a data-centric view of uh, data science rather than a model-centric view. So um, initially, uh, what the, uh, in, the, in our discussion, what we um, targeted is basically just any images of the C4 that we could find, whether they were labeled or unlabeled, whether they were um, from research vessels or from uh, core drills, anything that we could find. And uh, we, the first thing, uh, the first approach was to broaden our search and just collect whatever we could. And then we uh, filtered it down to see what, uh, which of these images or which of the data sets were relevant to our purposes. Uh, for example, uh, uh, some of the data sets that we've encountered were of the C4, but not exactly what we were looking for, a top-down uh, view of the C4, uh, which we could use to identify objects and species. It was more of a core drill sample, um, which uh, takes out a, a large column of, this, uh, of the uh, seabed uh, to examine its contents in different layers, which is, I think it was uh, for some oil drilling or mineral extraction uh, project or something. So, so that's yeah, a I guess that could be a good approach of like broadening your search and then uh, filtering it out later. Fair point. And I think that you, that's a really good reminder too, right? That your images need to look somewhat like the images you're going to have in the future. So um, your different angles, um, different locations, different things are really important as you're starting to build out that data set. Is there anything else that you think of that, you know, if somebody's trying to build a data set, you, you had a platform, you had a source to go and find images. Are there other places you've come across that you've seen as good repositories and trustworthy locations to go to try to get data? Yeah, uh, for um, C4 images, uh, two um, very large other sources were Squiddle and IMOS, uh, which are also similar um, open platforms where you can search for data and um, get it. The Nash, um, Natural Resources Canada expeditions were also a great source. So these are a few uh, sources that are specific to C4 images, but for other disciplines, I, I can imagine um, there's, there might be similar um, data libraries as well. But, and yeah, um, that reminds me of like, one of the first phases of this project was to identify a list of data sources like this and then assess which one of those would be worthwhile to go on first. I think too, this is one of the things we talk about sometimes where it's collaboration, right? There's um, when somebody's done a study and once they're done with it, making data available if possible um, is really good and this is helpful. And this is one of those prime examples as to why sharing your data afterwards can be really helpful. I think also though it gets into the tricky world if you're a company who's trying to build something that's for commercial purposes, it gets tricky because maybe you don't want to share your data. And um, it's, an interest, it's an interesting uh, challenge we have as we're trying to build more and more of those commercial um, uses of computer vision. One thing I'm curious about too is around your labeling and pieces and transferability. And I think, you know, touched on it, but can you talk at all about giving somebody some recommendations for making sure that they're building a data set that they might come back to and not regret not having included as much metadata in it in the first place. So maybe I wasn't as in thinking about bad example that, um, and maybe this isn't relevant. I was collecting images about sea stars. So I didn't bother including if there was a lobster also in the image. Um, are, are there, is there anything that you went through thinking through the short and long-term use of whatever the data set you're building? Sure, yeah, as I mentioned um, at the start of this presentation, one of the goals of this project is to be able to classify benthic habitats. So um, we were looking for labeled images and uh, we didn't really have any particular preference for any types of particular labeling schemes. Uh, here we saw one type of labeling scheme where um, you just um, represent what percentage of the image is covered by a particular species. 
there are other labeling schemes that have um, specific codes associated with particular species or particular um, groups of animals. So that was one part of like finding um, uh, label data sets. But regardless, um, just collecting a large number of images helps because a lot of unsupervised techniques are able to extract features from a large number of images and, um, and, and use those learned features to make uh, predictions or group images together based on similarity and stuff. Solid point. Um, and yeah, I think sometimes we don't always know what we're gonna be building. We think we do and then needs change. Um, and in terms of your, you know, your lessons learned future steps. So let's say you're moving into a new role with a company and um, you are no longer working on this piece. Maybe you're working on something related with aquaculture or shipping and logistics or autonomous vessels. And you need to think about starting to build new data sets or um, identifying that new things. Is there anything that you think is a really good takeaway? Like what are some of the suggestions you'd have when you walk into this new company and say, okay, I'm gonna go build this data set for training of a model for helping an autonomous vessel travel across the ocean and identify objects. What are some of the first steps that you think through? Thinking of this project, how would you go about it again with your lessons learned? Okay, so um, first thing I would uh, think about is the data basically. Um, as I mentioned previously, the, uh, the data-centric approach to data science is become, uh, becoming more and more popular than model-centric approaches because our models are only as, as good as our data. So um, that was one of the points that we um, emphasized more in having uh, good quality data. Uh, so for any future projects, um, one of the first steps would be compiling a list of data sources that we would want to collect from. And um, one, of the, one of the most important takeaways from um, this project would be, uh, I think the data cleaning phase and also identifying which data sets are uh, relevant and which are ir irrelevant. And filtering that out uh, automatically based on like the data set title, the information within uh, the CSV file, um, validating uh, whether the image URLs are actually valid, if they're broken URLs, things like that. Uh, I think the data quality issue ha has stuck more in my mind than anything else. Because even when we find data, it's not always in the right format that we want. Uh, as as uh, I mentioned, a lot of data sets have the same information, but with different names, with different column names. So standardizing all that. And I think this has been um, my greatest learning experience on this project. It is amazing consistency, right? Like we have lots of conversations with companies about labeling even annotations and where you could have one person, unless you're forced into a field of a dropdown, um, people can interpret things. I mean, even if you take computer vision and you take it to healthcare, um, somebody can call um, something for an MRI of a brain, you could reference a headache versus pressure in the head versus whatever, and you're not gonna have the same annotation and note for some of that metadata or data associated with things. So yeah, standardization is really important, but it's really hard to implement. Um, I'm just looking to see if there's any questions, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, shoot some questions in there. And the other thing too, is if you're interested in learning more about the Become Project or any of the other OFI, which is the Ocean Frontier Institute projects, um, be sure to check them out. We'll make sure then when we post this online, we include a link. Um, but this is all about multidisciplinary ocean research um, and mapping the ocean floor um, is an incredible feat. And I think it's something that um, we're all gonna benefit from and it's fascinating to watch as a project. And so we're really happy um, that you've been able to help support this project and work on building all of this out. And we really look forward to seeing what ends up coming from these images and what really fascinating models and predictions and analysis happen. Yeah, right now we're uh, working on uh, some models that we're gonna train on these data sets. And we're also working on um, writing a paper that, um, write, uh, that it talks about the details of how we collected all these data and describes this data set. So yeah, excited to get that out soon. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much for this. We really appreciate it. We also have a blog that we're going to share on this topic on our website, and we'll be sure to also email that out to all of you who are um, watching right now, and we'll include it on YouTube. And so thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your lessons learned and experiences with us. And um, data quality, data exploration, all of this is very exciting. So thank you all for joining, and we will see you for our next session um, in the future. Have a lovely Thank day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.